recording. Okay, now I think we're ready to go. So uh, welcome everybody to our um, bacteria monitoring class. Um, I'm Eric Admin with Snoking Watershed Council, and we're a all-volunteer nonprofit that works on protecting creeks and natural areas. Uh, we're also part of Global Water Watch, which is an international organization which has provided us with uh, training materials and curriculum and uh, methodologies that we use for this type of monitoring. Our agenda for this evening is we're going to talk about bacteria, what they are, um, why are we concerned with them, where are some of the sources of bacteria and water, and what are the techniques that we can use to monitor for bacteria. So first of all, just to talk about why do we care about bacteria, uh, we want to, bacteria is mainly of concern for uh, us. One, if we were gonna drink the water in a creek, uh, it would be of concern to us. Typically around here, we don't drink the water right out of our creeks because um, we have other water that we can drink, but we do get into our creeks, lakes, rivers, other water bodies for recreational purposes. And so our main concern in this region is, is the water safe for us to play in or swim in, fish in? Um, we're not typically drinking it, drinking it, but that's what we're concerned about. So bacteria are small single celled organisms. They're pretty much uh, all over the place. They're all over the outside of us and inside of us. They're pretty much essential for life. Um, we, live, we exist kind of symbiotically with them. Um, they have important functions in the world of breaking things down. Um, they're part of what we call the web of life. In other words, they just have a, a role in, and their role is primarily breaking things down for other things to use them. There's lots of different types of bacteria. And when we talk about uh, kind of the family tree of bacteria, so the bacteria that we're primarily concerned with are E. coli, which are a type of coliform bacteria. And there's multiple different types of E. coli. There's multiple different types of coliform bacteria. And then there's all kinds of other bacteria. And really the only ones that we test for are E. coli and other coliforms. And we'll talk about why that is. So E. coli is considered to be an indicator bacteria for fecal contamination, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's exactly what you have. So um, why are we concerned with it? <clears throat> We're concerned with it because if that type of bacteria is in the water and somebody accidentally drinks that water, gets that water into their system, it can make them sick. And um, lots of countries around the world um, this is more of an issue than what we have, um, but it is still potentially an issue here. And we'll talk about some sources of bacteria and water. So there's really just this one specific type of E. coli that's really of concern. But if you're finding high levels of E. coli in the water, it is concerning and you wanna to try to figure out what's going on there. So let's talk about some different sources of bacteria and water. So, uh, some of them, which can be controlled by us, uh, include pet waste. So um, dog poop in particular. Um, the city of Kirkland had a, kind of an experiment that they conducted where they went out to some parks and they kind of put these little flags down to try to raise the visibility of uncollected dog poop. And they found that there was a lot of it. And so when it rains, that can wash off the landscape into a stream. Uh, and so that's one way that that can get into water. Uh, another potential way that bacteria can get into water is if the sewer system is failing and some older um, areas that were developed longer ago have older infrastructure. And part of that infrastructure is a thing called a side sewer that connects the house to the main sewer pipe. And in some cases those can break. They're like a concrete pipe underground. 
and they can start leaking bacteria, which can make its way into a stream. Um, there's also instances where you find like an old property that was actually incorrectly plumbed, where they've actually plumbed the sewer pipe right into the creek. And um, for instance, uh, Thornton in, on Thornton Creek in Seattle, uh, Thornton Creek Alliance was doing bacteria monitoring in conjunction with Seattle Public Utilities as part of a, a community science project. And they did uh, large simultaneous data collection events and found that they were getting really high levels of bacteria in certain areas. And as part of their combined research, ultimately they were able to find an apartment building that had a sewer that was incorrectly plumbed. And so it was going into the storm sewer. And so that was getting bacteria into the stream. So that's one potential way it can get in there. Um, another way that it can get in there is just animals that uh, get access to the creek. So in areas that have livestock, people are encouraged to fence their livestock out so that they don't get water, don't get uh, waste in the stream. Kate? Is there any uh, difference between areas that have uh, sewers and areas that have septic? in terms of their um, fecal bacteria levels? Uh, that's a great question. Um, in areas that have septic systems, they don't necessarily have more or less problems unless the septic systems are not maintained. But if the septic systems are not maintained, then they definitely can be a contributor to bacteria getting out into the environment. So that's, that's actually a a primary source that that areas that still have septic systems they have typically they have outreach programs to try to encourage people to maintain their septic systems because that can be a big source so yeah that's a that's a good one as well and actually another human source that can happen sometimes is if there's like um, encampments adjacent to a creek uh, which happens sometimes that can that can be a source as well uh, also different animals out in the environment, like uh, this is at UW Bothell, they have a crow rookery. And uh, so all those crows um, roosting there uh, and pooping in the area in and around North Creek can create waste. And then there's just, you know, all the, the creatures that just naturally live in our, our water bodies. Um, you know, if they have a certain population, they're gonna generate X amount of waste. And so that they could be sources of bacteria. Um, so those are some of the different sources. And then just uh, sediment in streams, when you have uh, high runoff events that can also mobilize bacteria. So that's another way that bacteria can get into the stream. So let's talk about how we measure bacteria. So first of all, just talking about global water watch techniques. Global Water Watch always talks about doing it the same way, same place, same time. So they want you to be consistent, use consistent methodology. Um, what you may find is in terms of same time, um, if it's colder, bacteria are, they don't survive as well. So like in warmer months, you may tend to find higher bacteria numbers than you will in the winter time. But um, that doesn't mean you're not doing it the same time that's just uh, your variation throughout the year but they want you to do it consistently um their philosophy is give people simple low-cost methodology teach them some consistent techniques and they'll be able to generate credible data and when in doubt do it again so if you think you've made a mistake don't think oh i, I might have done it right just repeat your test and, and do it again versus recording incorrect data All right, let's talk about a concept in bacteria uh, measurement, which is called colony forming units, AKA CFUs. And so a colony forming unit is a clump of bacteria that are viable enough to form a colony. And so when you incubate a sample of water and it's got um, bacteria in it, it will you'll see these different colored dots depending on the uh, 
enzymes that they've kind of primed this card with, each of those represents like thousands and thousands of individual bacteria, but they, we consider them a colony forming unit. And so the, the way that bacteria is measured or the standard the, the, in water is how many colony forming units are there in a 100 milliliter sample of water. So CFU per 100 milliliters is the standard. So what we'll do is we'll calculate it in our sample. So depending on the sample size that we collect, let's say that it was a one milliliter sample um, and we found five colonies, we would multiply that by 100 uh, and divide it by the sample size, which is one. So that would be 500 CFU. So that's how we would go from the number of colonies that we collect to a CFU number as we extrapolate up from our sample size. And we'll go through some examples so you have some practice. So Global Water Watch has got standards for bacteria monitoring and uh, Global Water Watch's standards are, um, I'll say a little more liberal than Washington State standards. So according to Global Water Watch, they have this kind of stoplight uh, metaphor where they consider under 200 CFU is safe for contact, two to 600 is uh, okay for inter occasional contact and greater than 600 is not safe. And in Washington State, we have a lot stricter standards. And this is a section of the Washington Administrative Code talking about freshwater standards. And the current standards for freshwater are less than 100 CFU per 100 milliliters. And that is, we can get more technical about the specifics when you, when you get in there, you wanna have actually no single instance greater than 320 and you wanna have your uh, geometric mean less than 100 CFU. But if you just remember essentially that less than 100 CFU per 100 milliliters is the safe standard, that's what we wanna try to find or what we wanna to compare to. So uh, sometimes here's a, here's a concept about uh, streams being listed. So there's within the Department of Ecology, there's a thing called a 303D list. And this is a list that um, impaired water bodies can be added to or removed from. And so if somebody decides that this water body is impaired and they can document that it's impaired by a certain type of contamination, it'll get added to this list. Once ecology determines that this is the case, then they'll ask the jurisdiction that has authority over that water body to develop a water quality improvement plan. The idea is to try to implement measures to make that water body better. And then the jurisdiction will do some periodic monitoring for what they call a TMDL or a total maximum daily load. This is all just kind of contextual information for you. So it's not crucial that you remember this for like what you're doing, but just so you know what jurisdictions are doing. So they'll periodically sample and they're looking for, they don't want to find level above a certain amount. And so the, they have that same numeric standard that we we're talking about is their uh, kind of their TMDL, the total maximum daily load that they want to find. Okay, let's talk about the detailed steps of bacteria monitoring. So first thing you wanna do is you wanna get your materials ready. And currently we're using a methodology called R cards. And these are some pre-treated cards that you just add uh, sample water to and then you incubate them. You collect your sample with uh, a pipette and there are sterile pipettes that come pre-wrapped. And you also need to have a thermometer. Some of the other materials that we're gonna use, we use an incubator. So after we capture our sample, we will incubate it in the incubator. And then uh, as we collect our sample, we record some information on the data sheet. And then after we incubate and count our colonies, we record some more information on the data sheet. 
So I mentioned we're using R cards. There's actually quite a variety of R cards. Some of the different R cards that we've used are, there's some that are designed for E. coli only. And there are some that are designed for E. coli and other coliforms. And the main difference in these, uh, the way that they design these cards is when you collect your sample, put it on there, incubate it. Uh, after you incubate it for 24 hours at a specified temperature, these colonies will grow and they will appear as a certain color. And so the E. coli only cards, they'll appear as blue dots and that's all you'll see. So if there's no E. coli, you won't see any dots. The E. coli and other coliforms cards will, the E. coli will appear as blue dots. The other colonies, other coliform bacteria will appear as pink dots. We've kind of gone back and forth on which cards we're using. Currently, uh, I've just ordered the E. coli only cards because sometimes even though you would think pink and blue is pretty easy, sometimes there's some kind of shade variations that actually make it a little bit more difficult. You're like, well, what about a purple one? You know, does that count as pink or blue? So to try to make it easier for monitors, because we're primarily concerned with E. coli, uh, right now we're just using the E. coli cards but you may see these other cards. There may still be some on our system. All right, so let's talk about sample collection. So there's a couple different options of how you do this. One is that you can pipette directly from the stream and then you place the sample on the card at the stream. The other is that you can collect it in a sterile container and carry it off site uh, and plate it at another location. Really, there's another option, which is you can use a some sort of a, a like a dipper or something like that, where you can just walk a few feet away from the stream if it's difficult to plate at the side of the stream. But these are those are kind of the primary methods of sample collection. So uh, what we're going to do? Is, well, let me just talk about the details. So we collect either a one or three milliliter sample. So you collect your sample with pipette, and then you put it onto the card. You can let it gel for a couple of minutes on a flat surface because if you, once you put it on the card and you drop that flat back, if you immediately stood that card on edge, some of your sample would run off and you'd lose it. So we let it sit on a flat surface and then you take it back to the incubator. And we're gonna watch a training video. So hopefully I can get this to, Stop sharing right now. I'm gonna do a new share. Let's see. Okay, can you guys see this right now? Okay. You know what, hang on, let me stop this for a second. I think something's going on here. Did that look a little weird? All right, let me try this again. Let me, I think I need to do a, there we go. Think, yeah, the audio seemed odd. There we yeah, go. Yeah, it, it didn't look weird. The, the volume was just really low. <laughs> okay, well, let's see if this works better now. Eric Admin of the Snorkeling Watershed Council to talk to you today about how to use the R card for collecting water samples to test for bacteria. So we've moved to the R card recently from the Coliscan Easy Gel technique, and I'll show you the materials that we're going to use and a couple different ways that you can collect and plate your samples. So R cards come in a variety of sizes and types. So we have a couple different types here. We have the R card ECCA, and this is designed for up to a 3 ml sample. So you can see this is a larger card. And then we have the R card ECC, which stands for E. coli and other coliform, and a 1 ml sample size. Um, so you can do a maximum of a 1 milliliter sample with this one. Um, 
Other materials that come with the R cards are, they come with a sterile container that you can collect samples in if you choose to. Um, and they also come with pipettes. Uh, typically we order the one milliliter pipette, but in some cases uh, we like to use the three milliliter pipette. Although we've discovered it's easiest to actually collect a two milliliter sample with this. Now I'm going to demonstrate a few different ways you can collect your sample and then I'll demonstrate the process of plating onto the R card. So in terms of collecting your sample, there's three different ways. One is you can pipette directly from the stream. Uh, another method is that you can use the sample container provided, the sterile sample container, which can be sterilized and reused so you don't have to toss this after you've used it. Um, and then some programs use a dipper and so they collect their sample with a dipper and then they pipette out of the dipper. So I'm going to demonstrate collecting a sample with each of these methods and then how we plate the sample onto the R card so you can see how that goes. So with the dipper, this is a, something that you're going to want to rinse out two to three times with stream water. collect your sample and this is something that some programs like because you can use this without getting into the stream so I'm going to collect this sample and I'm just going to set it somewhere stable you could have a helper who holds it for you or you can just put it somewhere where it's not going to tip over so that you can pipette your sample out of that so then what I like to do is I like to get my pipette ready so for this purpose we'll, we'll do, a, do a three milliliter pipette and we'll do the three milliliter R card. Now, if you watch the Roth training videos, they recommend that they either use sterile forceps or sterile gloves for opening this. What we found in practice in the field is that that can be a bit difficult for people. So I think for our purposes, we're, uh, if you just have dry, clean hands and you're careful not to stick your fingers right in the principal area of the R card uh, flap, then you won't have a problem. So I've got my pipette opened. I'm gonna get my pipette out, ready to collect my sample. So I've got my clean pipette. And then I'm gonna take my R card and I'm gonna carefully open it up and just hold the flap back. And now I'm gonna collect a two milliliter sample. I could do up to a three milliliter sample. And I'm just pipetting directly out of this sample jar here. So I've got a two milliliter sample and I'm just gonna place this on the center of the card and keep it centered. And that's the trick with this technique, is keeping your sample centered. So once I've collected the sample, I'm going to let the lid drop back the flap and you can see how it starts to spread out and the key at this point is just to hold it approximately level. Luckily this is a card that's designed for a three milliliter sample and we're just collecting two milliliters so it shouldn't spread too far, it shouldn't spread beyond the edges of the card. Um, the other issue that people encounter sometimes when they're collecting on an R card is that if you tip your card sideways at this point, some of your sample can run off. And so at that point, you just have to repeat your sample. So the key is whether you hold it, or some people put it on a clipboard and hold the clipboard level, or you might have a partner and help you hold it. You just want to let it sit uh, level until, you know, maybe 30 seconds to a minute have passed. And then essentially it's spread out as far as it's going to spread out. So you can just set it on a level surface and you're ready to collect your next sample. So I could do up to three samples with the same pipette. Uh, for our purposes, I'm going to demonstrate collecting a sample with the one milliliter pipette. So I'm going to put this one away and I'm going to use a different sample. The next thing I'm going to demonstrate is I'm going to demonstrate collecting a sample with the container, the sterile container that comes with the R card. So in this case, and in every case, if I'm standing in the stream, I want to collect the sample upstream of myself, or I may not even have to get into the stream at all. So in this case, 
getting into the stream and collecting the sample in my sterile container. And if I wanted to carry this sample back somewhere, like say to my vehicle or another location, I could put a cap on it and I could then pipette out of this sample at a different location. So for your site, that may make it easier. In this case, I'm just going to put it on my box here that has my water monitoring equipment. But I mentioned clean, dry hands, so I'm going to dry off my hands so I'm not getting any additional bacteria or contaminants on the card. I could use hand sanitizer if I wanted to be absolutely careful. Uh, and now I'm going to get my one milliliter pipette out. I'm going to get my R card ready to collect a sample. So I'm just going to carefully pull this back. And I'm going to draw a one milliliter sample. And again, I'm just going to carefully place my one milliliter sample in the center of the card until the whole sample is there. Let the flap drop back. And then I'm just going to watch that sample and let it gradually spread out. And you can see that if I tip it, it does go in certain directions. So if I don't hold it level as it spreads out, it's possible it could go beyond the edge of the card. But at a certain point, it just quits spreading out. And you're safe to collect another sample and play with another sample. So for the last sample, what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate pipetting directly from the creek and then putting it on your R card. So this one I think is fairly safe right now, it doesn't seem to be traveling too much. So I can put this on a flat surface, just let it finish kind of gelling, which just takes a couple minutes. So now in this case, I could have a partner holding this card or I could be holding it myself. In this case, I'm going to get it ready to go so that when I collect my sample, I'm ready to put it right onto the yard bike. So I'm not going to get into the creek. I'm going to just draw my sample, making sure I'm not on the bottom of the creek. Okay, so I've collected my one mil sample. Again, I'm just going to pipette, place, plate it directly in the center of the yard guard. You can see how it kind of stays together in one bubble. Then release the flap. And again, I'll just wait for it to spread out. And then once it is finished spreading out and appears to be stable, I can set it down. And then we'll be ready to take these to uh, where we're gonna incubate them and place them in our incubator. So that's it for now. Uh, the next segment, I will show how we incubate the R cards. Okay, do you guys have any questions about uh, that demonstration of uh, collecting samples and plating? Sally Jo? Yeah, so were you doing three just to show us the three different, or do you do more than one at a time as a check or whatever? That's a great question. Uh, we actually, we always, as part of our Global Water Watch technique, we collect three what we call replicates. So every time we go to the site, we collect three samples, and then we're going to average those results and that that that's for a couple reasons one is because um there's some variability bacteria is not uniformly distributed throughout water as it flows along there and so by collecting three samples you're helping to overcome some of that variability um the other thing is that typically all three samples would be the same size and really we're actually tending to uh, recommend using a larger sample size. So the examples I did, there was one and two milliliters in that uh, video. But um, for the larger cards that we have, they're designed for three milliliters. I would say use a three milliliter sample if possible. Now, if you have difficulty with getting it to stay on the card, you can go down to a two milliliter sample. But the bigger the sample, the more likely you're going to get something. Kate? 
Oh, you're um, muted. Um, so I am taking a plastic sample bottle and I'm rinsing it two or three times in the creek and then I'm taking a sample and closing the lid and taking it home within 20 minutes and then plating it into my incubator. So I guess my question is, it isn't a sterile sample bottle, but after I use it, I rinse it out with chlorinated water and dry it. And then before I resample, I rinse it in the creek so that it's not slopping from, you know, session to session. Mm -hmm. Is that good enough, good enough hygiene or good enough procedure? Yeah, especially because you're, you know, you're rinsing it out with chlorinated water, letting it dry. So I think, you know, I mean, we're, we're trying to capture data that might, uh, I mean, we want to be accurate about the data here, but if we find something really alarming, we're also going to notify the local authority and say, hey, can you investigate this? They're going to follow up on it as well. Um, but yeah, I think that procedure sounds fine. All right, I'm going to, oh, Jeannie? Um, yes. Um, sometimes in the creek, you can see some bubbles and um, foam kind uh -huh. of looking bubbles. Um, do we want to avoid getting any some getting any of that and just go for the clear water? Or uh, I mean, it looks suspicious when you see these foam things going down the creek. Yeah, foam is its whole own topic. There's natural foam and there's foam from soap or foam from petroleum products, but. Um, when you when you collect your sample with a pipette, you want to be below the surface of the water. And I would I would try to avoid putting your pipette right in. If you see a bunch of foam, I would select a different spot because ideally you want to be in the part of the stream where it's running freely through sort of the mid middle of the channel or not right on the edge where it's eddying around. So hopefully there's no foam there unless there's a tremendous amount of foam. And then you want to make sure you're below the surface, but you're not disturbing the bottom either if it's a shallow stream because there's when you disturb the bottom you can stir up a lot of bacteria as well so you might get a false positive that way good questions i had a question about your pipettes hmm. so um i don't know were you like with the three milliliter pipette that you got a two milliliter sample, were you filling it all the way and then dripping it out until there's, I assume there's a two milliliter mark on it? Yes. Yeah. So you can, we have pipettes that are one or three milliliters and they have gradations. So like the three milliliter pipette has got a one and a two milliliter mark as well as a three. So you could, you could take any size of sample up to three with a three milliliter pipette and just fill it to the, the, the uh, point. And you can either squeeze it and let it, uh, the, the water fill up to that mark, or you can overfill it and then squeeze it out back down to that mark and either way is fine. All right, thanks for the good questions. Okay, I'm gonna continue on here. Okay, so that was, sample collection. So uh, another thing that you can do, um, I showed pipetting and I showed putting it as one big dot in the middle. A uh, technique that some groups use is this dots method where you distribute it around. And I think the primary benefit of it is, you know, it's a square card and with the round sample, you're not really getting out to the corner. So when you find, you may find when you get up closer to a three milliliter sample, that you have a harder time keeping it from leaking out around the edges of the cart. So one technique you can use is this dots method that may help with that. All right, so we've gone to the stream or lake, we've collected our sample, um, put it on our card. So now we take them back and we put them in the incubator and we're going to incubate it at about, uh, it's supposed to be our original, uh, we used to use Coloscan Easy Gel and they said 29 to 37 degrees, but uh, the R cards are 
essentially right at about 35 degrees plus or minus 0.5. You can go higher than that, um, but that's roughly the range that we want to be in. And these incubators that we have, we uh, they have a thermostat and we can pre-program them to the temperature we want. So we're going to incubate them at the proper temperature. And then after they've incubated for, according to Roth, it's 15 to 24 hours. But what I found is it's best to really go to 24 hours. And then you may find if you pull it out of the incubator and let it sit for a couple hours, it can be easier to read because the colors just kind of get more intense. But that's the basic process. So we're going to watch a short video on... Incubation. Oops, not that one. Sorry, you think I've done enough of these uh, Zoom classes. I have my act together. Um, okay, here we go. Okay, now we have brought our same. Okay, now we have brought our sample into the incubator and I have three different or two different sizes of our card. So typically what we're going to do is you're only going to use one side, either the one ML or the three ML size card. I just happen to, for training purposes, use two different sides so we could demonstrate the different ones. But I've got my incubator, which is preheated up to anywhere between 29 to 37 degrees Celsius. Uh, with the call scan, you needed to incubate for uh, 30 to 48 hours. With the R card, you really only need to incubate about 24 hours. What I've found in practice is you can read the cards after 24 hours, but they're almost easier to read if you take them out after 24 hours and then look at them the next day. The, the colonies have kind of defined themselves a little bit better, um, but you can read them after 24 hours. So uh, I'm gonna note on my data sheet, my sample size, my incubation time, which I'm going to start uh, right now, my incubation temperature, I'm going to note that down, this one is 35.5 degrees Celsius, and then my incubation period when it's done. Um, in this case, it says media expiration date, so we would just use the expiration date of our R cards. So all I have to do is open up my incubator. Place the cards in the incubator and then come back and check on them in 24 hours. Sorry, I'm muted. Go ahead, Kate. Um, how quickly do you need to get your R cards to the e incubator? And does the incubator need to be preheated? Uh, you don't have to get them to the incubator that fast. And no, it doesn't have to be preheated. How, I mean, like, could you leave them for an hour before you got them to the incubator? Yes, that'd be fine. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the only, the only other thing I'll say is, uh, if you, you do want to read them though, re relatively within, you don't want to wait, wait, like take them out of the incubator and wait a few days to read them because the colonies may continue to grow in your environmental temperature. I mean, typically they just, they mainly grow at the temperature you incubate them at, but if you do wait too long, you may get a erroneous reading. So they're really designed to be read at about that 24 hour period.
Okay, I have a question. So this is E. coli we're talking about. I mean, if we're incubating them, do we do we need to be careful at all? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think you don't have to be uh, like super concerned, but I would say you certainly want to, you know, after you collect your samples, you want to wash your hands. You know, typically in our water monitoring kits, we include a hand sanitizer. So I would say use some hand sanitizer before you leave the site. And then when you're handling the cards, you know, you could either, you could wear like uh, latex gloves if you wanted to, um, or I typically don't worry about that, but I do wash my hands after I've been in contact with them. And I think that's just generally after any of our water monitoring activities, if you've been in contact with the water, it's a good idea to wash your hands before you eat a sandwich. Okay, so that was incubation. And now let's talk about determining results. Okay, so we talked about uh, the official is you can count it after 15 to 24 hours, but I recommend 24. And uh, depending on the type of card you're using, like this is an ECC, which is E. coli and other coliforms. So this would have pink and blue dots. Um, you're going to count the blue dots. And as I mentioned, the, the count may increase after outside time, the, uh, after additional time outside the incubator. So you ideally want to record it at about that 24 hour mark. But if you wait a little bit longer, what I found is sometimes, especially with the ones that had the blue and the pink, the colors were kind of light. And if I let it sit for a little bit after coming out of the incubator, it's like the, the, the flap settled down or something, the color just got more easy to read. All right, so we're gonna watch a quick uh, video on uh, determining results. Okay, so now 24 hours have passed since we first put this in the incubator. So now we're gonna open up the incubator and see what we find. And, and so looking at our cards, what we find is that we do not have any dark blue dots. We just have pink, which means that we did not find any E. coli. Uh, unfortunately, this is kind of a cold and clear period without a lot of bacteria, so it's good from a bacteria standpoint, but not necessarily from an R card training standpoint. However, I do have an example of what we would have found if we did add E. coli. Those would show up as these dark blue dots like we have on this previously incubated card. So um, these will tend to show up better after an additional 24 hours. You don't gain any additional colonies, but you, they're even easier to read. So you can take them out now. You can read them now. If you want to make them even easier to read, you can let the card sit around for a little bit longer. So that's how you take the, inky, the card out and you read it. And then what we would do is we would just count up the number of dark blue dots, record that as our E. coli results, count up the number of pink to purple dots, count that as our other coliform, and that's how we record our result, and we'll just record that on our data sheet. So I'll just say that I made the training video, uh, that training video about a year ago, and subsequently I've learned that if you let the card sit for like another 24 hours, I have experienced finding more colonies. So I try to count it closer to the 24 hour period. Uh, any questions on that? Okay, we're gonna- and that, I do have a question. Oh, those, sure. cards, those cards just go in the trash? Yes, yeah. And which does seem wasteful, but I'll tell you the technique that we were using before was called Coliscan Easy Gel. And it was these plastic Petri dishes. 
And so we had three plastic Petri dishes. Plus we had a little plastic bottle of this stuff called media plus the pipette. So this is actually a lot better than the old one was, but yeah, those, those cards can just go in the trash and we'll talk more specifically about um, different cleanup recommendations. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna count our colonies. So we're counting the number of blue colonies for E. coli. And we're gonna determine how many colony forming units are in a 100 milliliter sample. So it depends on what our sample size was. So the math is number of colonies times 100 divided by the sample size. So if the sample size is one milliliter, it's just colonies times 100. But if it was three milliliters, then you need to divide that by three. So for example, on this card, if we had six blue dots, that would be six times 100 divided by one. So 600 CFU, you know, if it was a three ML card, it would only be 200 CFU. So here's another example. Uh, this is one where we a card that only has E. coli. So we only count the number of blue colonies. Um, in this case, if we had, if this was a one milliliter sample, it would be 1700 CFU. Uh, if it was a, a three milliliter sample, it would be just, it would be less than 600 CFU. So we count our colonies. Um, if we're using so the, the data sheets are set up and the original um, Global Water Watch program is to count the pink colonies as well, counting the other coliforms. Uh, the main reason to do that is because if you have a, let's say you had a card that was for E. coli and other coliforms and it was completely blank, that might indicate that there was something wrong or you forgot to put a sample on it. So that's why some programs still use the blue and pink. And that's why we were using those initially. Um, but we're primarily concerned with the E. coli. So that's why we've moved to the E. coli cards. But um, you can use the ones that are show other coliform. And if, they, if you do, um, you're going to count the number of pink colonies. And if there's too many for you to count, or it's just difficult to count, all those individual colonies, you can identify what you perceive to be an average square and then multiply that by the number of squares that are covered. So like for in this instance, let's say that I picked an average square and I counted 12 colonies in the square and there's 30 squares that were covered. So I'd say that was 360. Um, and then depending on the sample size, uh, for instance, if it was a one milliliter sample, that would be 36,000 uh, colony forming units. Uh, but again, the water quality standard is not for other coliform. The main reason why we would do other coliform is just to verify that we did have some bacteria that we got a legitimate sample. So then once <clears throat> you've done your counting, um, this is what the data sheet looks like. So you're gonna record the number of colonies. And so, um, you'll get familiar with these forms as well, but basically group, if you're, if you're with a specific group, um, you put that group name. If you're just with our Snow King Water Watchers, you put Snow King Water Watchers, you'd put your name, um, sample date and time, the watershed and water body, your site location. You'll determine if it was adequate depth or inadequate. Um, check the appropriate box there, record the temperatures your sample size, the incubation time is the time that you put it in the incubator. And then you'll record the temperature, how many hours it was, and then the media expiration date. When you get the R cards, you should either get them in a foil packet that has an expiration date, or if you've got a subset of those cards, somebody should communicate to you what the expiration date is on those cards, and you'll record that on the data sheet there. And then if you put it on our card on site, that's plated on site. Uh, transported on ice doesn't really pertain anymore. Uh, it used to be with 
the call scan easy gel you had to transport it on ice but um we're not concerned with that uh, and then you'll record your three replicates of e coli and if you're doing other coliform you'll list them there as well and then you'll uh, enter your data in the database so then now you've done your sampling, you've counted your colonies. Now you want to compare how it is uh, compared to what you normally find and compared to standards. So if you find greater than 100 colony forming units and 100 milliliters in your average of your three replicates, um, then you know that that water is not safe for recreational contact. That may be a chronic in the water body that you sample or it might be unusual. So you know, if you are always finding 5,000 CFU, then that's a case where you might want to get a hold of the uh, agency or local government that has jurisdiction over that water body that you're monitoring and say, hey, I'm finding this really high bacteria. What's going on here? And notify them about it. But you'll have to kind of monitor for a little while before you get a baseline of what's normal for your site. Okay, now let's talk about cleanup. So the R cards can be disposed of in regular garbage. Um, some programs uh, recommend placing them in a baggie with some isopropyl alcohol before disposal. Um, I'm, and you can certainly do that if you wanna be more thorough. Uh, I think compared to all the other stuff that goes into our garbage that the R card is not like an extreme biohazard, but, um, and then if you were doing this in a laboratory, um, uh, Roth uh, Bioscience has got some specific guidelines. So they're official guidelines. Uh, if you use the sterile bottles, you can just rinse those out and dispose of or recycle. And then you've got some different methods, uh, microwaving, autoclaving, boiling water, bake them in the oven, et cetera. Um, but generally we just say, um, you can dispose of them as waste. If you want to be more thorough, you can do the alcohol method. Okay, so now you've done your sample, you're done with all that, and now you've got your data. What are you going to do with your data? So first of all, you want to think about what does it mean? Is there anybody you need to notify? Do you want to share people, share this information with people? Is this a place where people go frequently and do something recreationally and you're finding high bacteria? I might want to notify somebody about that. Um, so how are you going to use that data? Um, and you may decide, well, I'm finding high levels here. I'm going to go upstream and downstream and do some monitoring and see what I find. And, you know, maybe I'm finding something that's localized or maybe it's endemic to the whole stream system. So that may, you, depending on what you find, you may want to expand where you're monitoring. And you're just generally kind of trying to answer this question. Is my water body's water quality getting better or worse than mine? Uh, one way that you can interpret data, this is using the Global Water Watch database. And uh, it's got a little uh, line in there that shows that 100 CFU. So this is uh, the stream that I live on that I've collected data on for years and it's had bacteria issues. Though actually recently um, at some sites more towards the headwaters i'm down towards the bottom end and it has been getting better but uh, anyways i use this data in conjunction uh, or basically to notify um, some local authorities about what we we're finding and we actually got into a partnership with the uh, city of bothell and they uh, started more intensively monitoring and investigating the stream so showing having your data and sharing it with a different agency can be one way to use your data and get some action. Um, you can also develop interpretive signs. So this is showing the old Petri dishes that we used to use. And this is a poster that was put together by uh, Lake Forest Park stream keepers showing kind of what happens uh, normally and then what happens after heavy rains uh, in Lake Forest Park streams. And so what they're showing is that even routinely the bacteria levels are high, but especially after streams. So people could 
you know, learn about that and decide how, you know, what can I do to make the water quality better or I better avoid it um, as far as recreational contact. So that's another thing you can do with your data. Um, this is an example from uh, Alabama, from Auburn University, um, where they did a thing that they call a blitz, where you go out and do simultaneous data collection. Uh, another instance of this is this has been done by Thornton Creek Alliance in North Seattle. And they've had a program where they were periodically going out and having all their volunteers go out at the same uh, day and time of week, or day, day of the week and same time and collect samples. And then they were comparing the results and they could find uh, like where a, a particular hotspot is. And that's what helped them locate that uh, misplumbed uh, side sewer that I talked about before. So this is another way that you can collect bacteria data and put it to, put it to use. Uh, another example from Auburn, they did some sampling of a uh, pond at the so-called memory garden and uh, put up a warning notice. Um, and some other Global Water Watch examples, uh, they did sampling throughout a watershed and used it to identify areas that needed to be cleaned up. Um, some programs use this type of monitoring, some volunteer programs, and they contribute to a thing called the swim guide. And so this is where they go around and they sample beaches and then the data is used to identify if a beach is safe for swimming or not. So those are some different examples of how you can uh, put your data to action. Uh, I should mention that we're working on a DNA sampling project right now. In fact, we just, I just had a meeting this afternoon about this. Um, and one way that you can try to get some insight into where the bacteria is coming from is by looking at the DNA of the different uh, bacteria that are found in the stream and finding identified different organisms they may be associated with. And so, you know, if you find there's a lot of human DNA, human bacteria DNA in a stream, and you're finding high E. coli levels, and that might tell you, oh, maybe we have a human source we need something to do about. And that is pretty much it. So uh, I just want to thank you guys for your attention and thank all these different groups and individuals that have been supporting our program. And I'm going to stop sharing now and ask if anybody has any questions. Jeannie. Yeah, um, getting back to the R cards, mm -hmm. I noticed that you had done some kind of a uh, uh, coding or um, add addition of some um, identifying data on the top. Is there any format that you recommend? I think you had date and maybe the sample size. Is there some um guidance on what needs to be on the card yeah actually that's a great great question what i typically do is i put like a uh the initials of the the site location um and then i usually take three samples and so i'll just number the pre-number the cards one two and three just so i can keep track of my different samples and make sure i'm i mean it's pretty obvious with the r cards it was Less so when we were using the Coloscan Easy Gel, and you have these little bottles of media that you were adding your sample to, whether you already put your sample in or not. But I still just out of habit, I number my one, two, and three samples, and then I'll put the sample size on there typically. So I'll write, you know, I might write Little Swamp Creek or LSC one, uh, put the date three ml sample. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I what I encourage you to do, and I actually haven't talked about that, is um, in addition to collecting your data on the data sheet, take a picture of your sample when you're done. And we have a, uh, a Gmail account that we're trying to keep track of um, that data uh, just for historical purposes if we want to go back and look at it in the future. So we encourage people to take a scan or a picture of the data sheet as well as the bacteria and send that into our... It's a, waterwatchersdata at gmail.com. Okay. And also the um, 
our cards only show the E. coli, but um, there's different densities of the colonies. As uh -huh. long as you can see it um, with, your, with the naked eye, do you consider it a colony or does it need to be any particular features that uh, make it too small or? Yeah, that's a great question. If you had, I mean, typically what I've found, the R cards are a lot easier, again, to read than the Call Skin Easy Gel was because you'd find some that are just like microscopic, like a dot. Mm -hmm. But the generally we say if it's bigger than, a, you know, a period, like on a piece of text, like on a page, mm -hmm. count it. So mm -hmm. if it's big enough that you can see it, you can count it. But um I haven't found that to be a problem. I found generally with the R cards that the colonies are either present or uh, at least with the blue colonies, they're either present clearly or absent. They're pretty easy to count. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, well, um, thank you all so much. I'm gonna stop the recording now and then uh, if there's anybody who didn't watch the get to watch the whole thing, um, I'll send out a link to the recording. So question, I, we don't have another class until the field day, right? Is that right? On the 23rd, I think it is. Yes. Yep. That's and do we know where that field day or will you just be emailing us where that field day is going to be? I am going to, yeah, I will send you information about where that field day is going to be. Uh, I've got some different training locations that have worked out well. So it kind of depends on how many people we have. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Eric. You bet.